I'm Christian Chiller. Welcome to my podcast, an enthusiastic ramble through whatever has taken my interest the past week or so. Expect technology, games, history, travel, geekery, and as always, much, much more. Welcome, welcome everybody once again to another Chinchilla Squeaks with me, Chris Chinchilla. I took a break last week, no particular reason, that's why I removed the weekly monkey from the show name, so I could do things like that. <laughs> now, um, actually this week I have a little bit of uh, news from other places, but then actually I have a, a little bit to, um, well, to to cover from me actually I've been I've got a few things I'd like to talk about a few things I've been going through the past couple of weeks a few pieces from me and, and things like that uh, but let, let's start with links that caught my eye this is an article from Wired UK from Morgan Mika Europe went bananas for gorillas then its workers rose up gorillas I think I might have mentioned before is a one of these kind of 10 to 15 minute grocery delivery companies based here in Berlin, but now all over Europe. Actually, it started in the suburb I live in just over a year ago, which is kind of amazing. And the concept is starting to expand to other countries, specifically the US now. And this is where things are interesting because the model has not been without controversy. Um, Gorillas specifically has been targeted around workers' rights. Uh, And I have mentioned before that I find that Interesting because I wonder why some of the others are not. Is it just because Gorillas is the biggest target or because it was the first to market? Uh, or do the others just not do anything wrong, which I find slightly hard to believe, but I'm not sure. So, but the, I think the, the more crucial thing is none of them are yet to be uh, profitable and um, many even question whether they ever could be. And so, not that that would ever stop uh, startup ideas expanding globally in the past, but um, it's an interesting one that a lot of people wonder why everyone is so keen to expand this idea around the world when it hasn't been massively successful so far. Or, well, I suppose it has been successful in some way. But then I guess you have services like Uber that have been going for a long time as well and are also, I think, only just, if if uh, if at all, profitable. It's... Also interesting how I find things like gorillas obviously grew out um, from the whole uh, pandemic situation. I don't know if they would have um, been as successful in Europe without that. Because it's strange for me, like I I was initially, uh, I found them quite amazing. They still are. But once I added up the uh, service fee and then tipping, because you kind of feel like you want to tip, versus, and then the convenient versus me just walking down the supermarket, which in many uh, medium dense European cities are really not that far away. <laughs> I started to get to the point where I wonder if it was really worth it, and I kind of stopped using them. Um, my wife is a little different; she still loves using them, but I kind of like to get out, and sometimes it's an excuse to uh, get out and do things. Um, maybe I became less busy. I'm not sure. So I find it interesting at a time that there's such controversy around them, and I wonder how popular they really are, but they're still expanding. And this article specifically focuses on a lot of the uh, workers' rights issues they've been experiencing, um, sort of around how companies here tend to organise and how they've blocked a lot of attempts at that. Um, But they have also... (sighs) There's also been kind of an interesting way they've treated workers, this sort of somewhat unfortunately common practice in many startups where maybe the founders are not so used to running businesses with people and they tend to say things and never really deliver uh, and kind of be, I don't know if sometimes if they're two-faced or just busy or just naive or inexperienced or whatever, but, you know, they kind of say things and then just don't really react in the right way. Um And there's a lot of cases where this has happened if you read through the article. I think the other interesting thing I find, especially with grillers, when they're targeted so much, is that when you read the numbers of people who are uh, not happy with them versus the amount of stuff they have, you start to wonder how much of a minority or majority of the workers that 
actually represents. Um, so that is also worth bearing in mind, especially when uh, you take into account what I mentioned earlier, that um, it's not the only one in this industry. And I still wonder why they're the one who are targeted so much when Flink and Getir and all these others don't seem to be, at least. Um, but gorillas certainly have not reacted as well as they could have. And that's probably one of the bigger issues. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Do you use these services? How are they being re- received in your city, be it gorillas or somebody else? Um, you can find out more about me at chrisangela.com. Uh, find my contact details there. Reach out, leave a message, and I would love to hear your opinions. Next, uh, also in the kind of mm -hmm, not so great tech bucket, this is an article from Rest of World by Peter Guest. Singapore's tech utopia dream is turning into a surveillance state nightmare. Now, I know this also from, from my wife who covers a lot of smart city IoT stuff. Singapore is one of these countries that is often held up as a shining beacon example of how cities could be doing it. But is there a downside to it? Uh, this article specifically focuses on um, a prisoner inside Singapore's Changi prison, uh, Jolovan Wam, but also goes into a lot of other areas where you know, Singapore is one of these interesting cities where... Things are great if you do the right thing, but then if you slip up ever so slightly, there can be some amazing repercussions. And this includes things like um, robots that enforce social distancing, which kind of sounds good, but then also when you think about it, it sounds a bit creepy. Um, the article digs quite deep into how activism in Singapore can work. Um, because Singapore is effectively a, a democracy, but isn't really, because there's not really any alternative parties. And since uh, independence in, I'm not 100% sure when, but it would have been in the past 100 years or so, I guess, maybe 150 years, it's basically been one party. So it's one of these sort of pseudo-democracies, shall we say, um, which are always difficult ones to to analyse. Um, so how do you protest that? Uh, and it's always very subtle. Uh, and if anyone's ever been to Singapore, it seems very nice on the surface, but also seems a bit kind of sterile. And this is, you know, managing to do um, protest around that kind of setup is, is an interesting one. Um, and uh, this particular centre of this article, so uh, Jolo, Jolovan, Jolovan Wham, he was put in prison for uh, performance art <laughs> and had been arrested multiple times. Um, and he, knowing that he was probably being filmed, he kind of started performing Hamlet and Shakespeare over and over again in solitary confinement, mostly to keep himself sane, but also almost to kind of make a whole other protest, which is, which is interesting. Um, and uh, all of this feeds into sort of a bunch of semi-centralized smart systems, um, which are usually used kind of, it's this weird fine line between carrot and stick approach in Singapore, it seems like. Um, and to many people, yeah, it's it's held up as a techno utopia. Um, driverless buses, robot dogs, flying taxis, vertical farms, uh, robots caring for the elderly, drone service freighters, um, warehouse and construction sites stuffed by machines. But um, that all comes at a cost. There's a lot of smart cameras everywhere and they're claiming by the end of the decade there would be 200,000. There's currently 90,000, which is already quite a lot for a relatively small place. Uh, facial recognition. Um, and of course, this is not unique to Singapore, um, but the fact that Singapore has a tendency to kind of see danger everywhere, uh, so uses it everywhere. Um 
And yeah, I think in my mind it came to this thought of care for what you wish for, especially when it comes to smart city type things. And I think this is where a lot of uh, data privacy advocates would would join in on this discussion in that it can initially seem like these things will be used for good, but they can very easily be misused and abused. And how do you know and, and how do you know to stop that when, uh, and I think many, this is one of the arguments against when people say, well, I have nothing to hide. And, and the answer is often we have nothing to hide now, also as far as you know. And uh, if there's a change in policy or a change in government, what could be used against you? Hard to say. But anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting article uh, and one that I discussed at length with, uh, with my wife, actually, around, um, you know, should you, should you even cover some of this smart city stuff in Singapore if this is what it's fundamentally used for? Interesting. It's an interesting discussion, you know. Um, do you celebrate the positives? Because there are some without with ignoring the negatives uh, what do you do um and yeah how do you operate in this kind of techno utopia um to many people they would kind of feel perfectly happy and safe but yeah you have to bear in mind that uh, that may not always be forever or you may come to a certain point where you disagree with something and then what do you do and now with the rise of um covid contact tracing and kind of passes this is now basically introduced to everybody. Um, previously, you might have been able to avoid certain situations, but now when you have to kind of do these check-ins everywhere, basically everywhere is being tracked. And um, there's a, and later in the article, it goes into great detail about migrant workers who are pretty much held up in fairly, uh, shall we say, conditions that don't necessarily match the rest of the population. And these cramped conditions can lead to rampant COVID cases. And this app would just sort of seemingly sometimes randomly decide whether they could work or not, um, even though, um, as far as I could tell, they, they were not sick. Um, so, yeah, you can already see it starting to kind of backfire against people who are accepted but not accepted, shall we say. They're kind of, yeah, I think maybe you see what I mean. <laughs> anyway, it's a fascinating article. Um I did used to spend a lot of time in Singapore on stopovers between uh, Europe and Australia. And um, there's a little bit of me who who wonders whether I'd want to go back. Uh, and I'm not completely sure right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's like China. I used to spend a lot of time in China. And that has really changed since we were last there. And I have the same sort of opinion now about Singapore. Would I want to be there? I'm not sure. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Away from some of these uh, darker topics, let's move on to some lighter ones. This is specifically from the Wall Street Journal um, by um, trying to find the author, uh, Rory Satran. But it's been covered fairly widely why uh, cool kids are now wearing wired headphones. And this is in all sorts of Instagram posts and all sorts of things. But I heard a very interesting opinion on why this is the case earlier. Um and that is because, and I have experienced this many times, a kind of earbud style headphones, people don't, it, it's kind of weird because they've become very common, but people don't necessarily notice that you are listening to something and can't hear them and start talking to you. And that wearing wired headphones, specifically the old school traditional Apple white cables that are very noticeable, um, are kind of a leave me alone signal. Which, and if that is the main reason, that kind of concerns me for a whole bunch of other reasons. But... Anyway, <laughs> I also find it interesting because those sorts of those sorts of headphones anyway were so precarious and would always fall out. The microphone would always bash around and all these kinds of things. If you want to wear like big wide headphones for audio quality, that I get. These kind of somewhat crappy headphones I don't quite understand. I also found it interesting because so many phones these days don't even have a headphone jack. So you have to be involved with dongles and things like that as well. I could almost imagine there being like a Bluetooth adapter to plug a headphones in or something just so you could have a cable. I don't know. Uh, it's bizarre. And uh, people think a lot of it relates to this kind of 90s throwback, which I have increasingly noticed even in Berlin and, and find it very peculiar because, um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of when I was a teenager, late teenager. So it feels weirdly familiar. And I suppose that's a sign of me getting old. <laughs> What do you think about 
that. I mean, what do you think about that as a signal, I suppose, more than anything else? Um, love to hear your comments, chrisandchiller.com. And you can see my contact details there to reach out and tell me, um, do you still wear them? Why do you still wear them? Is it for fashion or is it just because they're what you've got and you haven't bothered to replace them, which could also be a very valid reason. Okay, a few things leading into other bits of content from me via some other avenues. Um, I have uh, taken stock of a new Pixel 6 and I am working on uh, an article about my experiences with it. It's growing on me, actually. Um, And uh, I've been reading quite a few blog posts. I'm going to call out one in particular from um, Computer World by J.R. Raphael uh, that helped me kind of unearth some of the more hidden features. But I'm going to work on a full um, post at some point soon i have i think on initial thoughts i am very impressed with the camera i was taking some photos of various things and the depth of field on it for a camera phone is quite incredible and the yeah, the darkness uh well low light photography is also quite incredible um some of it is uh, has been discussed at length the difference between kind of how apple and google represent uh, night pictures. Um, Android has a tendency to make them more visible. Apple has a tendency to make them more natural, which is correct. It's sort of a matter of opinion, of course. But so far, I've been quite impressed with how it works. Um, but I am working on a uh, a post around that when I've had a bit more hands on. And uh, related to that, I have also recently um, got a new M1 MacBook Pro. I'm recording on it right now. I don't think it make much difference <laughs> to how you hear this. And um, I took a very different approach to 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 restoring from the previous computer this time around, um, and that has also been interesting. Which is something I'm working on documenting as I'm kind of slowly now identifying all the things I missed and got wrong and finishing the process basically. But again, I will do a proper review soon. But similarly, I'm quite impressed. Uh, especially the performance and the CPU and the lack of fan and all the things that other people have mentioned, it is actually quite incredible. Um, the, the keyboard is a joy to use. The screen is really nice. There's a few oddities I've discovered, especially today. And there's a few negatives, of course, with the lack of Intel processor, but generally quite impressed and um, getting there on the post. Uh, I think I'll be working on it this weekend, so watch out for that soon. A little bit of a writing um, segue, sequitur. First, NaNoWriMo wrapped up in November, unsurprisingly, and I published a a blog post on Medium um, about my my, um, progress, my accomplishments, my experiences. I'm not really sure what to say exactly. I worked on uh, the novel I have been working on uh, last year, actually, and got a bit further with it. I I met some of my targets um, and also through listening to the Scrivener podcast, I kind of was inspired to try a new way of writing some of it, which is also mentioned in the article. And the writing group that I manage here, I had a few people um, ask what I was using and I've also very loosely covered the tools I use there, which I think I will probably go into more detail in the future. So if you're interested in knowing how I write my fiction, then um, jump in, take a look. And um, yeah, I'd love to see your feedback on um, on um, your experiences with NaNoWriMo and how you use maybe some of the tools that I mentioned there. So jump over there, leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Also related to writing, uh, I have been trying to journal every day um, based on opinions of a few people. And I sort of struggled because I was being kind of overly negative with it. And I don't think it was really helping me. And I, I kept repeating myself a lot and I was sort of running out of what to say. Uh, and then I was discussing with someone and they suggested to me, well, wasn't the intention in the first place to be a gratitude journal to try and be more positive? So I started reminding myself of this and searching around uh, around gratitude journals and this is not an unfamiliar concept and i'm referring specifically to an article here on joincake.com written by sam tetro maybe 
um, on what is a gratitude journal. And I've been using this application called Diarily, and it has templates. So I intend to kind of rework those templates into a gratitude journal to make sure I have those positive prompts that not always focus on what was bad about the day and what I didn't like about the day and that kind of thing, which was half the point of doing it in the first place. And I sort of, I don't know, went down the wrong path. <laughs> and finally, a couple of things from me. You can still find my last solo adventurer, Sansibilia review and um, kind of wrap up of a playthrough on my YouTube channel. Um, I will do another solo adventurer soon. And also I revisited what is now called Video Ninja, used to be called OBS Ninja, um, just this week. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out how you can get guests and their screens into OBS and then your own live streams, take a look at that video. And I go live on, um, yeah, showing you how how possible that is. I think last week... I looked at Dendron, which is an interesting Visual Studio Code embedded extension for knowledge management. I'm not 100% sure if I would use it. I don't know if I have a valid use case for it, but it was actually quite interesting. So have a look at that video if you're into kind of mapping your thoughts and um, you might find it useful for you, basically. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed the show. Find out more about me at chrischinchilla.com where you can find show notes, sign up for my newsletter, and find all of my writing, games, work, and video links. There's also details on how to get in touch with me. And if you want to get even closer to what I do, join my Discord server for behind-the-scenes discussions and helping me produce my shows and work.